Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's something I think appropriate that we are convening our second Cronkite Global Conversations of the 2020 season on Abraham Lincoln's birthday, if my calendar is correct, because I think uh, President Lincoln would have welcomed this wonderful discussion and about an important part of the world. We are delighted for this series of conversations that began last week looking at female empowerment and will continue throughout the month of February. We do invite those who are here in person to make sure you sign uh, the sheet over there so we can keep track of who's coming and uh, Jan has provided lots of cookies assuming you've provided your lunch. Today we're going to focus on a fascinating part of the world that I know virtually nothing about. Sadly, I've not traveled there yet, but through these three wonderful Humphrey Fellows, we'll know a lot more about the South China Sea conflict. Uh, Camille Ilemena from uh, the Philippines is going to start and kind of set the stage for that. Hatran is going to talk about how her country is directly impacted by what is happening there. And then finally, not necessarily because they're in the same sea lane, which they're not, but certainly impacted by what's going on. Uh, Ang Neng So from uh, Myanmar or Burma. I love the fact that he lets me use them interchangeably. Um, uh, will tell us what uh, the China influence means there. And uh, this is not a dis China session. We also want you to know that we have a wonderful Chinese yeah. fellow who's part of us as well. And so I think it's just a vigorous discussion as President Lincoln would have wanted to try to understand what's going on. Uh, we'll begin with Camille. I forgot to hit a slide, so Jan's going to be mad at me because, well, where is it going? There we go. This is the, uh, what brings the Humphrey Fellows together is the theme of Cronkite Global Initiatives, to see the world, know the world, and report the world. We appreciate uh, some of our Cronkite freshmen who were inspired listening to the Humphrey Fellows just last semester come and join us and think about the other programs that they can do. Here's the picture that shows our three speakers today. You can see their smiling faces, but it's more important that you hear them in person. Camille, thank you. and we will have time for questions from the audience as we keep our fellows to their time. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Camila Lamia. I work as a journalist in Manila in the Philippines. And our group, we all live in that part of the world, the Southeast Asia. And we decided to do this topic on South China Sea because we already know the global significance of this. But you know, we know that you live from half a world away. So we decided to bring it to you. I hope you not really enjoy the presentation, but like <laughs> learn from it. <laughs> so first of all, we'd like to set the stage. Like, why are we talking about this? I mean, we are all from different regions, from different countries, but why is South China Sea important? 
I'll give you like uh, the main highlights of it. It is the major water thoroughfare connecting Asia, Europe, and Africa. It is very rich in natural resources, around 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and billions of barrels of oil are found there. And some of it are even untapped or unexplored. So there's a, a great potential. And uh, the third of global shipping passes through that. $3.37 trillion passes through that ocean. So to control the South China Sea is somehow to control global trade. And it is a major source of food as 10% of the world's fisheries can be found there. And also it is one of the most, if not the most biodiverse areas in the world. So that's the South China Sea. So the South China Sea, like the countries surrounding the South China Sea have overlapping territorial and maritime claims. China claims 80% or more now. Vietnam claims the Spratlys, this chunk of islands, and Paracel Island somewhere here. The Philippines asserts ownership of parts of the Spratlys Islands too, and Scarborough Shoal, which is part here. Brunei, Malaysia claims southern parts of the islands as well as some parts of the Spratly Island. So, it's a bit confusing if like you're from different countries, you're from different regions, you have different laws. But in the 80s, we had this treaty called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So treat it as, um, as a constitution of the oceans. So the Philippines, Vietnam, and other claimant countries that I mentioned, as well as China, ratified this treaty. So they recognize the international law that's being said here. So basically, just to simplify it, the UNCLOS, as we in the region like to call it, just says that every country has its own 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. So from the edges of your country, just count 200 nautical miles, and it's up to you and your government how you want to make use of that part. I'll show you a brief video so you can imagine uh, what the exclusive economic zone is and what China's role here. line. That's what China places the nine dash line. So basically that's literally just like nine lines and China says that, I mean China is using that nine dash line as basis for their claims of practically all of the South China Sea because they're citing history as the basis of that claim. So China's nine dash line made its way officially in 2009. The UNCLOS, which China also ratified, came in the 80s or even earlier. But uh, China, so in a map submitted by China to the United Nations in, uh, in 2009, they, they already inputted the nine-dash line. But China has never really provided the actual coordinates of this nine-dash lines. But basically, it extends 1,000 miles away from their edges. The law says 200 nautical miles, but China wants 1,000 miles. I wanted to ask you, are there any islands in front of China that can be counted like Chinese islands? I think so, there are, but uh, there are overlapping claims. So maybe some of it are also being uh, claimed by Taiwan mm -hmm. and yeah. Like territorially? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So with that, the Philippines in 2013, under a different government, under a totally different government, I should say, um, stood up to China in court. And they, because the Philippines and China are both, uh, they both ratified this treaty. So the Philippines brought that to the International Court of Arbitration. And basically, these are the five uh, points for Philippine states against China. First, China cannot use history as a basis for the claim over the waters. The nine dash line has no basis in international law. And this third one is very important, which you will see photos later. It said, the Philippines says that China's various maritime features are not really islands, so it has no right to claim the 200 EEZ. Because what China is doing is that in the map that you see earlier, for example, they are, uh, China is, China is building um, artificial reefs and islands there. So for China, what they're saying is, these are our islands. These are, our, these are reefs that we built. So 200 miles of that is ours, even if it's in the overlapping EEZ of other countries. So the Philippines said, no, it's not real islands, so you should not be claiming EEZ. And that China interferes with the Philippines exercise of its sovereign rights because they are stopping, uh, they are preventing Navy or basically all our vessels and fishermen from patrolling the area. And this uh, fifth point, how we'll discuss it later, it says like the irreversible environmental damage there. So make no mistake, this might be a case filed by the Philippines against China, but it sets a strong precedent for the other claimant countries. After three years, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Hague, Netherlands granted, uh, said that the Philippines won the case against China and they basically invalidated the nine dash claim of, um, of China. But China, of course, when we filed that case, they said, we do not adhere to that, even if we sign that law. And that after the ruling said, after the ruling was handed down, they also said, we will not participate. It's non-binding. Therefore, the continuous militarization in the South China Sea. I'll show you some photos. First is Woody Island. This is an island in the Paracels group of islands, which is being claimed by China, part of it Taiwan, and part of it Vietnam. So as you can see, there's the airstrip, there are port facilities, and there are bunkers. So they, uh, ch what China has been doing in the region is they uh, reclaim hectares and acres of land. Another strategy of China for the militarization of the South China Sea is what we call the cabbage strategy. Basically, what it just means is that if there's a contested island, they would, um, they would just make all their vessels small and big flock to that area to assert, to assert their control over that. So these reefs are claimed by the Philippines, but as you can see, there's also, they also built like an uh, airstrip runway hangar, also for the fiery cross reef and also for the mischief reef. And remember the first photo I showed you, that of Woody Island? This is a photo from the Chinese media showing a Chinese uh, military air force landing on those islands, on that island. And also like even in smaller structures like reef, China also has built a platform, also in the Paracels, which is claimed by Vietnam. Another strategy of China, because China for decades has been trying to prevent direct military to military conflict. So what they employ is the China Maritime Militia. These are smaller fishing vessels, but they are under the control of the Coast Guard or other parts of their Navy. They allow them to <coughs> excuse me, patrol the areas and assert their claims against, uh, assert their territorial claims. <coughs> China has also maintained its presence in islands or in, um, in shoals or reefs administered by other countries, such as Malaysia. This is in the southern part of the South China Sea, near Malaysia's maritime borders. A, a major concept in this area is, remember I told you earlier that a third of global shipping passes through this route. So it's very important there's freedom of navigation. It's also stated in that treaty. But basically what it says is anyone can pass by that area. But what China has been doing is they not all the time, they do not all the time block 
vessels from going there, but they make it difficult for other countries to do that. So in September 2019, China blocked a U.S. warship uh, performing freedom of navigation operations. But of course, the U.S. does not easily give in to what China wants, so they still continue the freedom of navigation operations near the Spratly Islands. And also other Western countries have already uh, have already sent their own warship and aircraft carrier in the region. So I just want to emphasize why we need the Western why we need the Western countries to patrol those areas. As you can see, all those other countries, other claimant countries are small. So for the Western countries presence, for the Western countries vessels to be present there, it's crucial to maintain the so-called balance of power. Just by their mere presence, the Chinese cannot easily do whatever they want in the region. But even then, it's not really successful. Now, this one, I'll just um, discuss this a bit because Hal will show you interesting videos and photos of the attacks on fishermen in the Southeast Asia region. These are just examples. So in 2016, a Chinese ship rammed a Chinese fishing boat being towed by an Indonesian ship. That boat was found illegally in the borders of Indonesia. And in 2016, a Vietnamese fishing boat was hit and sunk by a Chinese vessel. These are just three of the many instances. We couldn't put everything there. And also in 2017, like a Filipino fishing boat was fired upon several times. But I'd like to focus on this one. This was the most recent, this, this is like a major issue back home. A Filipino fishing boat uh, was rammed by Chinese vessels. So what happened was there were 16 fishermen there and they were bumped by a Chinese vessel and they got, and the ship of course got destroyed. They were left, they were left swimming on sea for maybe like a day. So two hours, the two fishermen decided to float for two hours and thankfully they found a Vietnamese vessel who rescued them. So that's what happened. That's the size of the boat that the Chinese vessel uh, sunk. So it's a normal commercial, uh, mid-sized commercial shipping uh, vessel, but still it does not escape any attacks from the Chinese. But what happened then was it was what China claims it is it was an ordinary fishing vessel that struck them. But as you can see what I told you earlier, that is somehow part of their strategy as international analysts point out the use of Chinese maritime militia to avoid direct military to military conflict. So now how we'll discuss about the environmental damages and other attacks on South China. Uh, hi everyone, and I would like to introduce you about the consequences of the island building in the South China Sea's uh, impact, uh, impact on the fisheries and marine environment. And so, as you know, the South China Sea is a global center of marine biodiversity with extremely high diversity of the habitats and species. And the spotless island, there are more than 300 300 uh, species of leaf coral. Uh, so, however, in the uh, previous 40 years, uh, the abundance of the organisms had decreased by 60%, and the most of the inshore coral reefs, uh, mangroves, and sea grass habitats are uh, degraded. So, and uh, you, you know that in the South China Sea is almost uh, an important fishery area with the uh, reported 6 million ton of uh, annual landings, and it uh, occupied 10% uh, of the world fisheries. So now everything are over harvested. Um, so you can see here, look at in the image. Uh, this is a fire cross island. Uh, it is a little more than one square mile in size and is home to Chinese military base. And the strangest thing about this island is that 12 years ago, in 2000, like in 2006, it didn't exist. And from the satellite, it is evident uh, that the scale of the transformation uh, that hadn't taken place on what used to be barren 
Rocky and uh, and also many many different countries and to the uh, island and you can see here. So uh, in neither did the six are the Chinese military base that have been built on human made island in this area. And you can see here uh, from the 12 years ago and until now. So the main contraction in this, so dangerous. Um, and here, and you can see huge and Chinese ships here, uh, collecting around the remote reefs in the Spratly Islands. And these ships are uh, rapidly pumping, like pumping sand and rock up onto the reef. And this building bury a big area of coral reefs. So um, in the process of the island building, so we can here see uh, the dredgers uh, uh, deposit uh, sand and gravel on top of the coral reefs. And some of the other activities are uh, related to land reclamations on these reefs, such as uh, creating access channels for ships or like um, dredging hybrid and destroying portions of the coral underneath. Uh, so you can hear like. And here is the, also the satellite image of uh, the, uh, the South China Sea uh, show man made scaring of the coral reef. Uh, which uh, occur, um, occurred between 2012 and uh, late 2015. Uh, when you see here, there are a lot of the scaring is a result uh, from the widespread of chopping risk by fish mat. <clears throat> and uh, you know, during the island building, and so the many fish men have harvested a giant plant shell. Like this, it is a luxury item and high return investment. And that's why they come here to explore and, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, do this and to buy with a more high, high price in the China. <clears throat> so here, like uh, the, this is the other shape of patterns are created by the profile of the small utility bowls and the most of the giant clam shells die due to prior meat harvesting of the nature life cycle. Um, <clears throat> and like this is also the, the other image that you can see the consequences of the, what the, the building and uh, devastating the, the giant uh, shell here. So, <clears throat> and now I would like to introduce a video about the, you know, you see the what's damage the, in the environment in the South China Sea. They do this machine to to go to like the sand in the island. And so after that they build in here, the underneath the, of the island is a recovery. of the building of the island impact uh, on the environment in the South China Sea. And I want to explain to you a little about the how China can extract the sand and gravel out from the within the legend and reef flat like here. And within, uh, with this uh, dredging action, the reef coral still not fully recover for up to 10 to uh, 15 years. It's man, it's damaged now. 
So this is the also there are the more than uh, 60, uh, more than 160 kilometers of the coral reef are damaged from the clam harvest and dredging or filling or filling. And you can see here at least a um, at least a fifth um, the uh, and then also the uh, 17 uh, square kilometer of losing highly diverse uh, fishery producing property coral reef and also the other other number that damage and you know here the China is responsive for 99 percent of the uh, of the overall damage in South China Sea. So you know the main, and there are also the many the number that you can see the damage of the stellar reef in the Spatley area. Uh, the main structure have been removed and to dredging. There is little prospect for recovering on the ecology time scale. Um, the um, building island in the South China Sea has also the negative impact fisheries and the sand and slip pool created by the dredging sand and gravel and uh, depositing it on the coral reef would have killed fish or expelled them from the reef. And here you can see the quantity of the marine life and the total fish stock have dropped by 70 to um, 95% uh, so since the 90, uh, 50 years. There, <clears throat> there are also the other uh, impact and uh, the damage caused by the China's island building activities may contribute to the food insecurity caused by the fishermen and, and harm the livelihood of fishermen in the region. So, <clears throat> Here, this is a conflict area zone. And so the China's new um, uh, building island leads to increase the Chinese fishing in the souring, uh, surrounding water, which will put further pressure on fishery in those areas. An increase of Chinese fishing activities also raise the risk of the clash between um, the Chinese fishing boat and those of other uh, claimant countries. And here you can see in 2017, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the annual cost of the garden budget that China spent more than what is this number. And so you know that China processed the world largest coast water fleet here in South China Sea. Um, <clears throat> and the China Sea has, has also uh, assets of uh, its claim to more than more than. 50% uh, of the South China Seas. And um, you can see here, I will show you also the other video that uh, China has uh, used the uh, marine uh, militaries of the world uh, equipped the best cells. And uh, they, uh, how they in contract attack the Filipino and also the Vietnamese boat in the South China Sea. So this video was taken by her. In uh, yes, it's um, the video that the, my reporters recorded in My reporters, um, they go to they they are they were in this boat when they recording this image and for to broadcast on DTV. And they want to view the model, like the image. This is uh, the image that the Vietnamese fishing uh, charter happened. The, uh, his name is Chen Banyan, and so he had been caught by the China Coast Guard since it's a separate uh, patrolling concept areas of the, of the South China Sea a few years back. And you know, and now 
they cannot continue um, in fishing in the South China Sea because now there are a lot of the Chinese uh, military here. And so that's why we cannot continue our fisheries. And there are also the, some like a recommendation to restore the peace here in South China Sea with lots of Chinese restraint and the American commitment to South China Sea is very, very important to get the peace on South China Sea. And there's also the ASEAN solidarity between the countries. Thank you. So next one will be from Ang. So we have both, Ha and I focused on the South China Sea, but we'd like to emphasize that the influence of China goes beyond the oceans. And that's why Ang will discuss the influence on land. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Al Manchu. I'm from Myanmar, Burma. So today I'm going to talk about uh, influence of China over Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar is a small country that is border with two large countries like India and Myanmar, uh, India and China, uh, and also with other countries like Thailand, Laos, uh, and Bangladesh. So uh, this is my country, this part is border with India, and this part is border with China. So Myanmar has like the longest borderland that is uh, with, with China, that is more than 2000 kilometers. And along the border side, there are a lot of ethnic armed organizations, and there are border trades, human trafficking and drug trafficking, and uh, a lot of natural resources problem. And more interestingly, uh, we have a project called CMAC, China Myanmar Economic Corridor. Uh, that is part of the One Bag One Road Initiative project, which is uh, China's big trade route uh, network that is going to overwhelm the whole world. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'd like to uh, give some information about the, the improvement of how the diplomatic relationship between the two countries has, has developed uh, uh, since like 1949. So as a non-communist country, Myanmar is the first country to recognize the foundation of People's Republic of China. Uh, but with, with, with around like 50s, there was a border dispute. China was claiming uh, three villages in Kachin state, but um, Myanmar government, so generous, they just easily give it. Uh, <laughs> and they were, uh, they were uh, yeah, we are very generous. Uh, and then also, I will discuss more, right? we'll see. <laughs> so uh, there are armed um, conflicts. KMT represents uh, Kuomintang from um, China, and BCP is the Burma Communist Party. It used to be the largest arm, one of the largest armed organization in the country. They based in uh, uh, in in China, and uh, there were a lot of trade agreements and delegation visits. Uh, and Myanmar has a, a people uprising in 1988. Um, uh, after 1988 revolution. Uh, well, Myanmar was in the military dictatorship since 1962 until 2010, but there was a big revolution in 1988. So uh, I want to highlight about uh, uh, the diplomatic relationship between 1989 and 2000, 1989 and 2010 in this part. Because um, from 1989, this is the brutal Burmese dictator Deng Shui, that's Chinese President Chen Ziming. Uh, so within the, these years, uh, there were a lot of high level delegation visits. There were a lot of armed um, deals, a lot of uh, trade and, and hydropower plants projects. Uh, but I want to highlight three of these. Uh, they, they agreed to uh, establish an oil and gas pipeline from Rakhine State in 2009. Uh, now it's 2019, now the, the pipeline is ongoing. So they think like really, really early before. And this pipeline is also one of the part of the one by one initiative. I will discuss soon. And there was an agreement to build three hydropower projects. And the last one is Misong Jam Agreement. Misong, in Burmese, Misong means the junction of the river, which is the initial point of Ayari, the core river of the country, like the longest river. And a lot of people, like millions of people, are depending on the hourly for in their daily, daily, daily lives. So that was agreed in 2006. Uh, then um, a lot of, we have, in Myanmar has first civilian government 
uh, it is not a full civilian government. It was like a, we, we say quasi civilian government because the government was transformed from military and then they just changed their uniform. And uh, there was a so-called election in 2010. And they win it. Uh, we call the civilian uh, was leading by one of the retired general generals. Uh, so in his time, this this near term term dam agreement was postponed because of the, a lot of pressure. But now China is pressuring Myanmar to restart it again, and they do a lot of PR with local people as well. So this is our de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi and Nobel Peace Prize winner. It looks like she's looking to the west. Uh, uh, um, so um, they met two times uh, 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 in 2015 and 2020. In their recent meeting, that was in last January, there were 33 MOU agreements between the two countries. Uh, and also agreement on the building of two other hydropower projects in 2010. Uh, <clears throat> so these 33 MOU agreements were part of the One Belt One Road initiative. Okay, now they're shaking hands. Uh, we have an uh, economic policy, uh, uh, one of the, the economic policy by National League for Democracy government. Uh, National League for Democracy is a political party that was leading by Aung San Suu Kyi. She became a political prisoner. She was under house arrest for 15 years, and then now she is the leader. And a lot of like Western countries have supported her for her freedom. Now she is under criticism because uh, she has been silent. Uh, when Myanmar military was committing genocide against Rohingya community in the west of the country, which is border with Bangladesh. Um, so the reason that I mentioned this is that uh, our government is facing a lot of pressure from the west. So they have started implementing an economic policy called Look East Economic Sport Policy. And, and China became the largest investor and the trade partner of the country. So within 30 years, there were 20.24 billion of investment. Uh, so this is the investment showing my center. The biggest one is 57%, that is power, and, uh, and oil and gas is 18%. So I want to highlight that, that Myanmar became the source of energy for China and all the projects. So um, this is the area showing, the, the, the map showing a map of Myanmar showing all the investment projects by China. The red color is hydropower and dam focus. So this part is border with China, and this is border with Thailand. Uh, so this full area is, is, is a conflicted area. There are a lot of ethnic armed organizations they based in there for like more than five decades. And we have a longer civil war in the country. So in this area, is China is focusing on a mining project. Uh, this area, there are a lot of farmers, they were in jail, there they, they were land confiscation because of all these development projects. And a lot of hazardous problems uh, by like cement factories, hydropower plants. And well, most of the people or uh, investor in the country, they are welcoming a lot of development projects. But the problem is that the government or the investors are so irresponsible because they were not thinking of any, they, they didn't make good EIA, like environmental assessment tests or, or like they didn't have any evacuation process. So these are the major projects, hydropower plants, seed is compromised, oil and pipelines, and CMAC and BRI. BRI is like Bear Road Initiative. Uh, uh, there, there are like a few other names called like one pet one road initiative, also the sick road project. So Myanmar and BRI. Myanmar is a small country, but the, 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 the role of Myanmar is really critical uh, in, in this project. So uh, when, as my colleagues were discussing before, uh, when China was facing a lot of problem in South China Sea, but this part, Indian Ocean, like Bay of Bengal, it is so easy for them to get assets. <laughs> uh, because Myanmar government is so welcoming and there was no test. <laughs> and, 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 and China was, uh, the, the Mr. Xi was treated as a big brother. In 2013, a lot of, uh, some men were protesting, uh, Buddhist men were protesting against the government because uh, the military, there was a brutal crackdown for protesters, the farmers protesters. And then, uh, 
some ministers show up and apologizing, uh, apologizing uh, the, the monks. And then they say like, uh, oh, we cannot complain to China because China is a big brother for us. Uh, so as I discussed, the diplomatic relationship between is getting better and better, really better, especially in this time when the country is facing a lot of pressure from the West. I'm not saying all these pressure from the West are unfair. Well, it is totally fair, but, uh, but I'm against like uh, sanctions or like, uh, like that is really affecting to the government, the government and the, especially the people. Uh, this, now there are like some targeted sanctions by you from US and the EU to some Burmese general, that's good. But general sanction on the country is really affecting. That will push Myanmar like more towards the China and a lot of irresponsible uh, investment uh, that will bring a lot of problem to the country and the people. So uh, why Myanmar is really important in BRI. So most secure outlet to Indian Ocean. So they are, the route is until here in Africa. It's really, really huge. Uh, and Myanmar became the source of energy. So in this part, part uh, so that was the oil and gas pipeline project that I discussed earlier. That was agreed in 2009 during the military dictatorship, but now they are running. <clears throat> and also it allowed China and oil tankers to come here and, uh, and send all the oil to like Kuming really easily. And there will be a deep sea port here as well, deep sea port and uh, train route from across the country. So there are some key areas uh, in BRI project. So Kachin State, Shan State, Rakhine State. There is a common thing between these three areas. All of these areas are conflicted areas. So uh, in Kachin State, we have China Myanmar Economic Corridor project. This project is we also have this project in Shen State too, and Miso Hydro Power Project that I discussed earlier. Miso means the junction of the river, initial point of the, the, the ERV river, the main river in the country. So Kachin State, why Kachin State is so important? So Kachin State is the most shortest way that can connect between India and China. So that is really important for China. Uh, and I want to highlight two uh, by Miso Jam project, that is called 3.6 billion project. Uh, th so 3.6 billion dollar uh, uh, that is now postponed. Uh, but also uh, it was stated that the project is postponed. A lot of people were displaced from the area. There were three townships uh, in uh, Kachin State near the Miso Jam River. They had to evacuate. The company kicked them out. Uh, the company kicked them out. Now they, 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 they are displaced and they have to live in uh, different places. And also there is a potential of flood. Uh, so that flood can happen the size of Singapore. And uh, like 10,000 people can be displaced if there is a, a flood. So I mean, the project is not totally postponed. It is still there. Uh, and the company is still based there. But the government officially stated that it is postponed because of a lot of protests. Uh, but now, uh, Chinese ambassador was pushing Myanmar government, and also they are meeting local people to, to like doing a PR to accept this project. Uh, so, uh, Miss of Jam project, it was suspended in 2011 and necessary for BRM because uh, it can produce a lot of electricity. Uh, and, and, and now, Aung San Suu Kyi is also supporting this Miss of Jam project. They were given a reason that the country doesn't have enough electricity. But actually, only Kachin State alone, it can produce, it has 80% uh, uh, of uh, excess electricity. Only 20% of electricity that produced from Kachin State are used in the country. But the government is saying that there's no enough electricity. So that's why we have to have this project. And, uh, and, and also the other reason that government was claiming is that uh, if the project is canceled, they have to give compensation. That is $3.6 billion. According to Global Witness, uh, so there are a lot of jade mines in Kachin State. We are so rich in natural resources, uh, especially the military in the country. 
so according to the global witness, only in 2015, 2014, uh, government received tax of 3.4 billion dollars <coughs> from Jade Mine only in 2014. So only by a, a single year, they can easily give the the, the compensation back to the China Chinese company. Uh, but still, uh, Myanmar is doing that because because they they have the policy called Low East Economic Policy. And there's another one, see my China Myanmar Economic Corridor that is worth 400 million and and, and it's going to be wide for like 4,700 acre. But it is not started yet. But there can be a lot of land confiscation. As I discussed here, uh, there are a lot of like potential damage to ERV, uh, 10,000 people can be displaced, and land confiscations. So Shan State, one of the biggest state in the country, uh, a biggest state in the country, and a lot of ethnic armed force live there. So there will be a real, a part of the railway project that is uh, going parallel together with the gas pipeline project will be there, part of it will be there, and economic zones. So we concern about armed conflicts and a lot of uh, complaints uh, and illegal migration too uh, <clears throat> uh, from both sides. So this is the train route. Uh, so this is a this is Chao Kyu, you know, that's booming. Uh, so this is Shan State. That's Shan State. So part of it is there. So Rakhine State. Uh, in R R Rakhine State is important because it will allow them direct access to Indian Ocean, and also it is the initial point of oil and gas pipeline project. That was agreed in 2009. Now, which is which is operated, and also there's Chao Q uh, deep sea port. Uh, there was there were some lo local documentary that revealed that uh, now some oil tank gas are coming into Chao Q deep sea port, and that bar a lot of fishermen from take uh, fit doing fishing and things. And uh, and also Chao Q and your country also has booming railway and uh, oil and gas pipeline, but that's really long. Uh, these are some uh, facts about oil and gas pipeline and deep sea port. Uh, uh, the company promised that local people would get a lot of benefit. But still, although uh, oil and gas project is running, and also uh, there are a lot of oil tankers in the in the, in Rakhine, but still Rakhine State is the second poorest country, uh, second poorest state in the country. So concern land confiscation and environmental issues. Uh, so consequent, what is the consequent? So there are a lot of drug trafficking and human trafficking and land confiscation protests. Uh, last year, there was a journalist who was in jail uh, because he was covering uh, local protests uh, uh, organized by farmer. They were against uh, a Chinese investor company. And uh, Myanmar can be uh, one under uh, uh, that trap of China as well. Uh, and and, and Myanmar has like 10 billion of, of debt uh, to like different countries, uh, but 25% of it is that Myanmar owed to China. And, and also delay in the national reconciliation process because there are a lot of natural resources problem and all these development projects facing the country. And irresponsible investment. Thank you. Very impressive presentation and educated all of us a great deal. I know the audience has saved some questions for the end. And uh, we hope you have some, because I know Andrew Leckie has at least one. Um, but he goes first. So uh, regarding South China Sea, uh, you said that there was occasional patrolling. But what's the official position and unofficial positions of the, of the big powers of the US, of Russia, of the EU, even Japan? And, are they consistent or they change uh, when the administration administration changes either in US or or in Philippines because uh, I know that you change your relations with the US when you change your uh, 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 president and uh, uh, a second question is what's the how big are the investments of China in Philippines and how are your diplomatic relations are they hurt because of the incidents that happens in the sea so for the first question, U.S. has been fairly consistent with their patrols in the South China Sea, as well as Australia and Japan. So what they do is, so like for example, Japan, instead of regularly patrolling the oceans, what they do is they give um, vessels to the Philippines and to other smaller countries to somehow strengthen their 
coast um, coast security. So, but Australia kind of fairly, uh, I mean, like consistent. But for uh, what do you call this? France and UK and the European countries, it's just last year that I heard that they have sent their warships and their aircraft carriers in the area. But mostly, as I can, like, I'm sure Ha from Vietnam will agree that it's mostly the U.S. that the states there in our region are relying upon to maintain the balance of power in the region. And I want to um, include a little information about why the U.S. had to be uh, in the South China Sea to resolve the conflict in this area. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, maybe before the Obama administration mm -hmm. and um, how to say the China Sea uh, situation is a concern of the Obama administration. Yeah, and now, to to Asia. yeah, and so, but now um, the situation is changed with the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And that because the Trump don't focus on the South China Sea. And this is why the China is now become a powerful countries in and they want to be uh of the powerful um country of in military the and that's why and with the how to say the missing of the of the united states in the south china sea and with the china is growing and that's why now the situation in the south china sea is more and more severe yeah that's mm -hmm. but they are consistently sending at least one to two every yeah yeah, aircraft carriers. Uh -huh. yeah. I don't want to disappoint Bill. So <laughs> uh, certainly, it's great that you're doing this. This is really now one of the most important issues internationally, and it's going to be even bigger in the future, I hope, in some kind of a positive way. Uh, but uh, the president of the Philippines uh, said earlier this week that he wanted to sever military ties mm -hmm. with the U.S. And the immediate reaction from the State Department was, wait a minute, what about the South China Sea? Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that? And I know explaining the Philippine president is a lot like we explain the American president, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> they say a lot of interesting things. But what's your thoughts on that? I think it's good because it's related to Gigo's question too. So under our new president, we had like, for the longest time, you have to understand, US has been the traditional ally of uh, the U.S. is the traditional military ally of the Philippines, but under this president, it has changed because um, same with Myanmar, our president doesn't like being bombarded about issues on human rights and everything, which is really a concern of the West. And for our president, it's not like, why are you insisting on those Western values on us? So with that, he pivoted to China. So what happened was um, the Chinese some Chinese businessmen supported his campaign, and then when he won, it was worthy. It was a worthy investment for the Chinese because it was a it was a it was an abrupt change. Even our military, even ordinary Filipinos, are not used to relying more on China than the U.S. Because the military, the soldiers of the Philippines are trained by the U.S. So it's a very, um, it was a very abrupt change. And with the cancel, this cancellation of the visiting forces agreement, that's a treaty between the US and the Philippines that uh, an attack, basically it's like an attack on the Philippines, uh, US will attack as well. But obviously that's not the case because it, US has been, uh, has been not a good ally in terms of that. But with the South China Sea, it like with this move of the cancellation of the VFA, it's close. It's more of closely giving away our power to China because, as you know, we won this landmark. Uh, vic we had this landmark victory against China, but the our president with this pivot to China has not been using that power to assert our claim on the South China Sea. And then coupled with the cancellation of the treaty, it will be like an official China party in the region. I want to ask a question, like uh, we do understand that power dynamics are changing in West and East. And uh, I know Vietnam uh, role is very cautious when, while dealing with a foreign policy with China. Even Myanmar is turning into China right now. So as the time will move faster and we understand that China is becoming like with this uh, whole economic project and we are also part of biggest uh, partnership with China and others people like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei will be you know, parting with China. 
don't you think as a personal label it would be opportunity for like a biggest alliances for the east yeah i mean it's i mean and even as a state actor it would be like a same decision to be partner with china Wait, so to clarify your question like we need to partner with china no i'm just asking i mean like um, you mean can it be a you know, opportunity yeah it would be oh, yeah, opportunity because well, everybody is like trying to you know pool with the country so now like it's a tricky balance we well we discussed this um militarization in the south china sea make no mistake we also have like we cannot live without the economic uh the economic strength of china so it's a tricky balance for our governments as well but at the same time i think well we focused on that in our respective countries we are still focusing on the economic benefits that we get from china mm -hmm. but just on another similar topic uh with the eastern coalition i think it's hard for the asean because as you can see some some ex, uh some poorer countries they're being tapped by china as allies so we cannot really even in our small tiny region we cannot even have our own um solidified stand on the issue I have a simple answer. If it is like a, a responsible investment, <laughs> of course, it can be a good opportunity. But the thing is, like, they have lack of like concern on human rights, and they don't care about local people. So that kind of irresponsible, irresponsible uh, investment, it is not. It is not an opportunity. That's the point. And then a lot of because of a lot of all these like investment projects, like hydropower projects, mining projects, uh, the there can be a lot of displaced people uh, and people have a lot of health problems destroying biodiversity like in Vietnam. So you know in the South China, I'm sorry, in the Asia, in the South like they, we for example in my country and China, we had the same borderland between the two countries. And that's why I got that we have a, a lot of conflict in the South China Sea and the economic like many are the easiest but we have to respect we want to the harmony and that's why sometimes we have to be like it's you know, very tricky, tricky yeah. that especially we're so poor we cannot like really go all out we have to use a diplomatic policy to resolve the issues with china we have time for one more question does anybody have not had a chance before Hugo does his zinger at the end <laughs> all right go for it so what I hear from Ang uh, is actually happening in uh, Europe and in Africa. So China would come, uh, there's a big project, and then they do, you do a study, cost, uh, is, it, uh, is it efficient project, uh, cost benefit analysis, and it, if it's proved that it's not, nobody wants to fund it. Like World Bank don't want to fund it, EU don't want to fund it, and then China uh, comes and says, okay, we're gonna fund it. Uh, you get like a, from Exim Bank or, or some other big state banks, you get a loan for 20 years, and then you go into basically debt slavery because this project obviously cannot repay for itself. So do they also do this in Vietnam in, in Philippines, uh, like they do in Myanmar and some, some other countries? Do we have the project, big projects that are funded by China? Yeah, we do have, um, like for the airports and for ports, but many act because it's fairly a new thing for us to be this close to china because for the longest time it's just the us so people are still raising hell about it maybe compared to myanmar that they're passively accepting everything but still ultimately at the end of the day it's still president duterte's sole decision no. on what our foreign policy is but yeah there are yeah there are there are a lot of projects uh, like this uh, and, and, and in myanmar most of the companies like big companies are owned by like like government affiliated companies or military owned companies so they really support all these uh, investment by mm -hmm. by china and most of them most of these chinese companies have like shared by the the, the government too yeah so just like uh, an example they're like our white our third provider for our cellular phone because we just have two so one got an approval from congress but it's state owned by china so yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Good government. <laughs> At least. Yeah, Let's give another good. round of applause to Camille Hahn. Thank you very much for an excellent session. We hope you'll be back next week, uh, one week from today, Refugees and Humanitarian Action. More cookies, more fun, and more good conversation. We hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you.